Dr Samantha Nixon is a venom scientist. Her specialty is spider venom. Spider venom is an incredibly potent cocktail of molecules, and scientists are using it to develop medications that can treat neurological diseases like stroke, epilepsy, and also chronic pain. The thing is, you have to get the venom before you can use it in medication. And how do you get venom from a deadly spider? Well, you milk it, of course, which might be a challenging prospect for many of us, but particularly if, like Samantha, you grew up a full-blown arachnophobe. Hi, Samantha. Hi, Sarah. Tell me, Samantha, about the first time you had to handle a tarantula in the lab. What happened? The first time that I had to handle a tarantula, I was still full-blown arachnophobic. So even walking up to the room where we keep our spiders, I was already nervous and shaking. So I lifted the lid off the container with this big Australian tarantula in it. And I was told to not be afraid because if I was afraid, that would make the spider more aggravated. Um, What, they they can smell your fear like a dog. I didn't know that tarantulas could sense if we were afraid (laughs) of them or not. Well, they're very sensitive to vibrations. So if you're shaking, that's going to, they're going to pick up on that. So with a shaking hand, I sort of reached down into the tank to pick up the spider and, um, You sort of grip them by the back of the head between the second and third pair of legs. And I was also afraid to touch the spider, but also of hurting it. So I wasn't holding it probably as firmly as I should have been. And the spider was having none of this. So she (laughs) wriggled free. And actually, she scratched me with her claws as I was picking her up. And I didn't even know that tarantulas have sharp little hooks on the ends of their feet. So I panicked and I said a few words I probably can't say on radio (laughs) and just dropped this big sort of hand-sized tarantula into my lap. And then I screamed and just unconsciously flicked the spider from my lap. And then she fell onto the floor and scuttled under the cupboard. And by that point, I was legs up on the chair, shaking, thinking like, I'm going to have to quit my job, my new job on day one. <laughs> this is not an auspicious start to your, to your career as a venom scientist. So you flicked it off. And, and then what happened? Uh, Well, I was, you know, feet up on the the lab bench stool at that point, but uh, my supervisor, Dr. Volker Herzig, was immediately down on the floor and he he said, we have to catch her and we also have to check on her because a fall can injure a tarantula. And that was when all of a sudden my brain went from me being the victim in this scenario to, I might have injured this poor, beautiful spider. So I got down on my hands and knees with a, a ruler to try to investigate underneath because all of the cupboards have this like basically spider sized gap (laughs) underneath them and so you can't really see but you're trying to trying to gently coax the tarantula to come back out from underneath the cupboards (laughs) uh, and into a container and fortunately the spider was all okay oh and you managed to get it back into the container and and back into its home yes yes with with a with a long paintbrush uh, i gently coaxed her to come back out and then very quickly put a plastic container over the, over the top of her as soon as she emerged from under the cupboard. <laughs> so that was your first day with a spider in the lab, Samantha. What are your earliest memories of spiders from when you were a kid? Oh, I, I'm not certain why, but I was always terrified of spiders. I never had issues with snakes, never had issues with sharks or anything, but spiders... I could not do, you know, walking in the botanical gardens, I would be, you know, hiding behind mum as a kid because there were big orb weavers in the gardens. And there's a particular incident that was very traumatic for me in high school uh, where I was playing soccer on the oval with some friends. The ball rolled down the embankment, so I naturally I just ran after it uh, without thinking into the bush and ran face first through these huge golden orb weaver webs, which, as you know, are these giant, really sticky spider webs. And I was covered from head to toe. But worst of all, I had the web and the spiders stuck in my hair And one of the spiders had even fallen down my school shirt. I was actually frozen with fear. I was, I felt like I was either going to pass out or be sick. And 
I had a bunch of guy friends that, you know, I've been playing soccer with. Do you think any of them were brave enough to come to my rescue? <laughs> no. Uh, it was some of the other girls from my class who came over and gently helped pull the web and the spiders out of my hair. But from then on, I was probably full-blown nightmare arachnophobia. Oh. Like, And so were you terrified and just didn't want to know about them? Or was it the kind of fear where there's part of you that can't look away? Where, where were you on that spectrum? I was in the can't look away. I, I had this sort of morbid curiosity fascination with the spiders. And I would actually read a bit about them, almost with this idea that if I knew my enemy, I would be able to better avoid them. So I remember actually at school, we got to go to the Queensland Museum and I found out that they had a spider collection. And I asked if I could see it because I was like, I'm terrified of spiders, but I'm really curious about them. <laughs> they, they showed me the spiders in the museum, the live tarantulas and that that they had. And they took the lid off and they coaxed the tarantula to come out, but she didn't come out gently. She sort of bolted out. And I had my face right up against the glass trying to see the spider. And as soon as she bolted out, I just threw myself backwards. And everyone at the museum was laughing because they thought that I'd set some sort of Guinness World Record for the fastest <laughs> human movement ever recorded. <laughs> well, what were your passions as a kid, Samantha? What sort of things were you, were you into? Did you enjoy? You know, growing up, I always loved nature and wildlife. I would watch every David Attenborough documentary that I could get my hands on. I used to love going to, you know, the Brisbane City Council libraries and borrowing out all the marine biology textbooks and just reading about our, our natural world. I could probably name every dinosaur. <laughs> and uh, actually, as a kid, my favourite thing to do was actually to go to the Queensland Museum on the weekends and, and get to walk the stacks and see all the animals and see the fossils. And I used to beg my parents to take me to the Science Museum pretty much every weekend and they would have to say, you know, it's exactly the same as it was last <laughs> Saturday. Uh, and I would say, yes, but I still want to go. <laughs> but the funny thing is that I actually never imagined myself as a scientist despite growing up with this real love for biology and curiosity for the world purely because I think I'd never actually met a scientist. I really didn't realise that you could study science here in Queensland until I started to get older in senior high school and I got that chance to go really see the Queensland Museum and also tour the University of Queensland which is where I got to go into a research lab for the first time and then all of a sudden completely changed my plans from studying law to studying science. Hmm. You were studying science as an undergraduate. What lecture did you chance upon that started you thinking differently about spiders? So I was actually doing biochemistry and we were learning about peptides, which are the primary component of most animal venoms. And there was this sort of research extension option to go and study a scorpion venom peptide. And I was doing that and really enjoying it and learning about how venoms can be harnessed to make eco-friendly insecticides and, you know, new medicines. Um, so I went to my biochemistry lecturer and asked, is there anyone doing this, this work here at the University of Queensland? And she directed me to my, the person who became my PhD supervisor, Professor Glenn King, who was giving a talk and he got up and he said, spiders are going to cure, you know, the world's biggest problems. We can harness the neurotoxins in their venoms to treat epilepsy. We can shut down the parts of the brain that are causing seizures. Or we can shut down the pain pathways that are responsible for chronic pain. And since spiders are the world's greatest insect hunters, we can use the toxins in their venoms to make eco-friendly insecticides. And I was sitting up the back of this lecture, it was a massive lecture with probably a thousand people attending as just this little undergraduate student. And I was completely enthralled. I, I was almost inducted into the cult of spider venoms in that, <laughs> in that session. So I walked up to Glenn at the end of it, not realizing that Glenn was a huge figure, like one of the founding fathers of this field introduced myself and said, I'm terrified of spiders, but the work you're doing is so cool. 
I would love to come and see your lab and volunteer to force myself to get over my fear of spiders. How did he respond? He sort of laughed and (laughs) took me to come see the spiders and sat me down and asked, you know, what is it about science that you love? What is it you want to do? And I said, what excites me most is this idea of studying the natural world, combining, you know, wildlife and ecology, and then harnessing that to help people through developing medicine. And he also agreed. So he took me on as an undergraduate student. But originally I asked if I could come work in the neuroscience part of the lab, you know, using the spider venoms to work on, you know, drug discovery for epilepsy. But there was not enough sort of space in that field. Uh, There was already too many students working on that. So he offered me that I could try working on spider venoms for antiparasitic drug discovery. And at the time, I wasn't that keen on parasites, but I thought I'd give it a go, get a foot in the door and see what it's like to actually work in this venom venom field without realising that that would mean that I would actually be working, not only facing my fear of giant hairy tarantulas, but spending the rest of my time elbow deep in sheep manure collecting blood-sucking worms. (laughs) You're making it sound so glamorous, Samantha. (laughs) I really, I really had the best PhD, <laughs> but I absolutely loved it. And it re-inspired my love of science so that I eventually committed to becoming a, a research scientist. Who taught you how to be hands-on with spiders in the lab? So that was my, uh, one of my PhD supervisors, Dr. Volker Herzig. He's this very kind, funny, giant German man who always wears socks and sandals (laughs) apart from when he has to go into the lab and he was just born without fear I think genuinely because he has zero anxiety about picking up any spider at any time so I volunteered to help him he was taking care of the the spider collection at the time and I volunteered to help him and I started out you know, trailing him in the lab and he very generously and kindly was explaining what the types of spiders were, what they ate, how to take care of them and how important they really are for both venom research and also in our ecosystems. And as I started to learn about them, they became a bit less scary and it got to the point that I could, you know, give them food and water and then I started to name them which is really what helped me get over my fear the most, I think, because I had, you know, tarantulas like Beyonce, (laughs) and you can't be scared of a spider named Beyonce. (laughs) I had a tarantula named Whitney Houston, but uh, it was pretty early in my career at that point, so I wasn't very good at sexing spiders. And it turned out that Whitney Houston was actually a boy. So then I had to call it the spider, formerly known as Whitney Houston, or Houston for short. (laughs) How do you tell the sex of of a spider? Well, it's actually not not super easy in my defence to sex the spiders. Some species, it's a lot easier, like for the golden orb weavers, the females are massive and the males are teeny tiny little spiders that you almost almost invisible in the web. That's how small they are. With the tarantulas, there's a bit of a size difference as well, but the easiest way to tell them apart are these pedipalps, which are, they kind of look like short legs on the front of the spider, right next to the fangs, and these are the sexual organs. So in the males, it looks like they've got little boxing gloves on the end. So through naming your um, your spiders after great figures in American music, you start feeling better about them. What's involved in taking care of a spider in a lab? I mean, food, how do you know if your spider's hungry or not? Spiders are generally pretty easy to look after for the most part. I sort of joke that I'm usually taking care of a box of dirt because if they're happy, the tarantulas will usually be sitting down in their burrows and you don't even see them. They basically get water once or twice a week and I just miss them with a little spray bottle. The funnel webs usually get offended at that and they rear up and try to show off their fangs. <laughs> In terms of the food, they, the spiders maybe get fed once a week. The, the tarantulas and that can actually go for months without food if they have to. But when they are hungry, they'll come up to sort of the top of their burrow and you can sort of see them peeking out. And then um, you can throw a cricket in there and they'll dart out and grab it and drag the cricket back into their burrow. Is there a correlation, Samantha, between the size and, and scariness of a spider and its toxicity? 
Not so much for spiders. It is a general rule of thumb with scorpions, for example, that the bigger the pincer, the less toxic the venom. So a lot of the really deadly scorpions have got teeny tiny pincers, but extremely potent venom, whereas the larger scorpions tend to rely more on their pincers and less on their venom. The nice thing about working with spiders is there's actually over 50,000 species on the planet but less than half a percent of those are actually dangerous to humans. And it's really just Australian funnel webs, redbacks and black widows, Brazilian wandering spiders and uh, the brown recluse spiders. So the vast, vast majority of spiders, whether they be big tarantulas or teeny tiny jumping spiders are actually not dangerous to humans. And I can just tell that this is a mantra that you would repeat to yourself as you started getting used to handling those spiders. What you've said though, it reminded me of the, I don't know if it's an urban myth. I mean, I've heard it from my children rather than scientists such as yourself. So let me ask you, daddy long legs, they look so innocuous, but is it true that their venom is is highly toxic? That is an urban legend, yes. So there's no evidence that daddy long leg venom is a threat to humans. I think where it comes from is that daddy long leg spiders will actually hunt and eat redback spiders. And so people have probably seen that and known that redback spiders are a potential threat and gone, well, if this spider's eating that, it must be even more dangerous. But fortunately, daddy long legs, totally harmless. Well, how can they eat a, a, a redback and not be harmed? I think they mostly use, you know, they've got those very long springy legs and they basically walk over the top of the redback and then come down and quickly bite it so that they avoid being bitten by the redback. You mentioned the sex organs of, of spiders and that the, the male ones can look like little tiny boxing gloves. What about mating behaviours? Are there, are there unusual mating behaviours around spiders that distinguish them from, from other creatures? Well, absolutely. I mean, many of the females will eat the male spiders. Redbacks and black widows are the probably famous example of that. When we have tried to breed some of our spiders for some of our experiments, it's it's always a highly stressful situation. So we'll put... For the male spider, um, not least of all. <laughs> uh, he's the one who's directly on the chopping block. Usually, like, you have this male tarantula that's quite a lot smaller than the female. And um, he has to gently approach her and they do these courtship behaviours where they drum their legs on the ground and let her know that he's coming and he, he fancies her. And then if it's going well, he actually has to lift the female tarantula up over him and hold him over her, sort of like, oh, what's the movie where you've got the famous dance lift of... Them? Dirty dancing. Dirty dancing, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> it kind of looks like that. And then he has to take those petty pals, those little boxing gloves, and use that to deposit his sperm into her and then put her back down and scurry out of there before she decides to eat him. <laughs> so me, who's attached to my spiders, I'm sort of watching but trying not to watch to give them privacy, but carefully there with a, a, some tweezers and a cup to separate them if things look like they're going wrong. <laughs> and, and what would be the evolutionary rationale of the, the female eating the male? Why, why would that be something that spiders have developed? Oh, it's a good question. There's uh, definitely people working on that. There's a few sort of benefits. Um, one is that she gets a really great protein meal straight away. It also that it prevents the males from mating with anyone else. It certainly <laughs> would. <laughs> but I have to say that one of the, the spiders that I really love for the courtship rituals is our very own Australian peacock spiders, which are these absolutely stunning spiders with these beautiful bright orange blue green red colored abdomens and they're only tiny smaller than your fingernail but the males will go out and do these elaborate dances where they're waving their legs and their colorful abdomen to impress the female and I, one of my favorite things to do if I've had a bad day is to go on YouTube look up peacock spiders and YMCA and people have put their dancing to, to various songs. Okay, I know what I'm doing as soon as we finish speaking. Thank you for that tip, Samantha. What's the process of molting that spiders go through? What's that for? What's it involve? 
So spiders are invertebrates, so unlike us who have our skeleton on the inside, all of our bones are kept inside our skin, um, spiders actually have an exoskeleton. So inside of them is all squishy and juicy and the outside has got this hard chitin protective layer. Now that's really good for the spiders except when they need to grow because that exoskeleton doesn't expand. So to grow, they actually have to shed their entire skin, including the fangs. Uh, which is a very stressful process for them. And the way that they do it is they actually burst out through the back of their head and then they have to pump their hemolymph around their body, their blood, to be able to sort of squeeze themselves out through the back of their head. And then when they emerge, they're very soft. They often come out like a white colour, sometimes a bit bluish. You can see their hemolymph running through them. And then it takes them a few days to harden that new layer. And in that time, that's when they're able to grow. <laughs> Amazing. How regularly or how often do they do that over a life cycle? So when they're young, they do it quite frequently. For araniomorph spiders, which are the modern spiders, and that includes things like huntsmans and orb weavers and jumping spiders, they actually stop when they reach maturity, but the tarantulas can molt for their whole life. They just, as they get older, they do it less and less. So the large tarantulas that I have in my lab maybe do it once a year. Of course, we humans, if we lose a limb, there's nothing we can do about growing that back. But what about spiders? So yes, spiders can actually regrow their limbs in that molting process. It doesn't come back fully with the molt. It's sort of an iterative process. So I've got a couple of tarantulas, for example. One of my tarantulas had lost her leg when she was collected, but in the two years that I've had her, she's um, molted twice now. And she's got this little nubbin of a leg that's maybe a third of the length of her other legs. But as, as time goes on, it'll eventually grow to be the same length as her normal legs. What happened to the spiders in your lab, Samantha, at the end of 2019? Uh, so I was working overseas in 2019. I spent time in Europe and the US and the Amazon learning from really great scientists around the world to bring new skills back to Australia. And unfortunately... In that time while I was away, some new spiders were brought into the lab and they had infectious diseases. So just like us, spiders are also susceptible to viruses, bacteria, parasites. And we ended up losing a lot of our spider collection to some infectious diseases, including parasitic mites. So as the pandemic hit, not only were we socially distancing as humans, but I was actually socially distancing all of my spiders that were remaining and putting them into quarantine. And as these parasitic mites spread through the lab, it was particularly a problem for our funnel web spiders. So I ended up having to set up a Sydney funnel web spider day spa where I would take <laughs> the spiders out of their containers, um, anaesthetise them a little bit for my safety <laughs> with some carbon dioxide gas, and then very quickly with a paintbrush and a little bit of diluted ethanol try to pull all the parasitic mites off of the spiders before they got too awake <laughs> and then put them back in their containers. How did the public help when you were then needing to restock your spider supplies? Oh, the public was fantastic. We did a story with ABC at the start of 2020 which I didn't really think much was going to happen. But just a general appeal if people had funnel webs or tarantulas or large spiders in their backyards, if they wouldn't mind letting me know. And the story went live and I ended up with literally thousands of people contacting me from all over the country Take and even as far as the USA, <laughs> <laughs> reaching out with their spiders. And it was fantastic. We were able to completely replenish our spider collection, especially because with the pandemic hitting shortly after, we weren't able to travel to do our normal field work as well. So that was just invaluable. And it was so wonderful to get to talk to so many people who, you know, most people were emailing saying, hey, I'm kind of scared of spiders, but I saw the work you're doing and I'd love to help. I've got this big huntsman. What can I do? And getting to have conversations with people and encouraging them to be, you know, excited and curious about the spiders in their backyard. A lot of people went from saying, oh, I'm going to squish this spider if you don't need it to okay, thanks for, you know, sharing how important they are with me. I'm going to let it go in my garden. And that just, that made the world to me. This 
is Conversations with Sarah Konoski. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. Samantha, where do all the spiders that, that you and the other scientists at UQ research, where, where do they live? So we keep our spiders in an insectary and it's a really special lab that's separate from our main sort of chemistry and biology labs. It's actually got this double airlock door, so it's sort of space age. You know, there's a porthole that you can look in. You've got to swipe to get in, and then it takes 30 seconds to open the door. Then you have to go through the airlock and swipe again. You get air blown down on you to make sure that you're not bringing any, anything in or out of the lab. And then inside, I have about 100 different spiders, all stacked nicely in little Tupperware containers. <laughs> Do they make webs, the, the, the spiders that, that would naturally make webs in the wild? Do they do that in Tupperware or what do they do? how do they live in there? Yeah, so we try to set the little containers up as best as we can to make the spiders comfortable. So we keep all beavers from time to time and you'll see that there's a, a day where initially they're a little bit shocked to be in a container and then the next day you come back and they've set up a lovely golden golden web and they're hanging upside down, happy as, happy as a clam. The funnel webs are constantly moving the dirt around in their containers and building nice little burrows doesn't matter if I try to set it up in a pretty way with, you know, some rocks and some, some nice little plants. They just dig them up and set it up the way that they want. <laughs> They've got to have the right feng shui. It's not just spiders <laughs> in your insectary. Who's Hector? Oh, Hector is one of my absolute... I'm, I'm probably not supposed to have favourites, but he is my absolute favourite. He's my love bug. He's a rainforest scorpion from Queensland that I had for the entirety of my PhD. I've had him for about five years now, actually. And he's grown from the size of my pinky nail to just a little bit under palm sized. And he is such a sweet scorpion. I can put my hand in his container and he'll come over and investigate. And usually he comes and has a little, a little bit of a cuddle. He'll come hang out on my hand and we'll walk around and show people how cool scorpions are. What colour is Hector? So he's actually um, sort of a dark brown colour, which is really good for helping him camouflage. Normally he would be living under sort of logs and rocks. But what's really cool about the scorpions is that they actually fluoresce bright blue under UV light. And that's actually how we find them when we go out in the field. During the day, they can be quite tricky to find because they're really well camouflaged. But if you go out at night with a, a black light torch, you can just roll the logs over and you'll see dozens of bright blue little scorpions scurrying around and then they're much easier to spot and catch. And what makes your little research section in the insectary stand out, Samantha? Uh, my cupboard is pretty obvious because it's decorated with Christmas decorations that I've made for my spiders. Um, <laughs> so they all got little stockings. <laughs> uh, you, maybe I've got two attached to them, but it, it's got a warning on there saying like Samantha Nixon, Sydney Funnel Web Spiders, do not open, you know, like first aid details and contact details. And then it's got little like, you know, streamers and balloons for them for their birthday. <laughs> You say that you, you maybe you're getting a little attached. I mean, how long might you get to know a, a funnel web for? How long do they live for? So spiders, particularly the tarantulas and the funnel webs, are actually can be really long lived. Like tarantulas can live for 25 years. Funnel webs are pretty similar. Uh, actually, the oldest spider ever recorded was a trapdoor spider down in South Australia that lived to be 42 years of age. So some of these spiders have actually been passed down from sort of supervisor to student, multi-generation spiders. And how do you go about getting funnel webs in the wild? Where did you get yours from? There are actually uh, about 40 different species of funnel web spider spread up and down the East Coast. They're not just in Sydney. I particularly work a lot with the Queensland species. So one of the places that we get to go, uh, which is really tough to have to do field work, is the beautiful Gari, Fraser Island. 
And usually when I say that, people think of the dangerous animals on Gari as being, you know, maybe dingoes, maybe the coastal taipans. I got to meet a coastal taipan on the first day that I was there in the in the toilet, which, you know, just kept me on my toes. But actually in the sand are some of Australia's largest funnel web spiders. And so I get to be lucky enough to go over there and find them. And the way that you do that is you sort of walk around the bush. They're often on um, a slope at the base of a tree because that tree will then help protect them from rain and flooding. And the burrow is really distinctive. It's this funnel web, which gives the spider its name, with these lines of radiating silk. And we call these trip lines. And the spider uses that to sense vibrations and figure out what's sort of happening on the surface while it lives happily in its burrow. So when prey walks across those trip lines, it's sort of like ringing the the doorbell and saying Uber Eats is here. So the spider will jump out and grab the insect. But if it's really big vibrations, that signals to the spider that maybe there's some large predator and they'll retreat down into their burrow. So... After careful experimenting, I found that the best way to dig these spiders out with the team is that we actually take a spaghetti spoon (laughs) because the teeth on the spoon help us to dig through the sand and the tree roots. But the spoon is gentle enough that it doesn't hurt the spider. So I have to sort of dig alongside the silk burrow, which can be like 30 or 40 centimetres deep, and it usually twists around tree roots. So it takes me a good 40 minutes to dig, dig a spider out. And then down at the base in this sort of silk chamber that we call the sock is a very angry, very large funnel web spider. Oh, how is it reacting to you arriving with your spaghetti spoon digging away at its burrow? What does it do? I think it's really funny. Most of the ground burrow dwelling spiders have the same reaction. They kind of just put their fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 no one's here. (laughs) They put their head down in their burrow and they just stay still and figure if they don't move, they can't see you, so you can't see them. And they just stay there in this state of denial until you get really, really close. And then it's like a switch flips and they go from there's nothing here, no one's here, to I'm going to bite you. So what do you <laughs> in, uh, do? What do you do in, flat. in that moment? I <laughs> uh, try to catch them really quickly, usually. <laughs> I need more detail. How do you catch a funnel <laughs> web, an angry, denying funnel web really quickly? I mean, are you wearing gloves? Oh, I don't usually wear gloves when I work with the spiders because I find that gloves slow me down. I need to be uh, able to use my hands quickly. And it's kind of pointless because the spiders can bite through leather. So a glove is not going to do much to protect me anyway. It's more important that if I am handling the spider that I can feel that I'm holding the spider correctly and feel how the spider is responding. So when we're um, putting the spider in a container, it's usually that we will literally just kind of put the like a little Tupperware container or a small tube into the, the dirt crater dirt hole that we've dug and then take like a paintbrush or something and just gently tap the back legs of the spider to encourage them to run into the tube. If they're fast moving, I usually just try to throw the plastic container down over the top of them and then the good old fashioned slide up like a piece of paper underneath and (laughs) get the lid on the container. (laughs) Are you making noises while you're doing this, Samantha, or are you a very calm, focused scientist? Oh, I would say initially there was a lot of commentary on my part of, oh no, oh God, oh God, as the spider was running. But now that I'm used to it, I'm pretty, uh, pretty quiet. I don't think I say anything. I'm usually just focused on the spider and I'll probably only say something if it looks like the spider's getting away and I need a hand. Have you ever been bitten by a, a funnel web or thought you'd been bitten? Oh, so luckily I've never been bitten by a funnel web. There was a a moment when I was out in the field once where I was digging a burrow and I'd sort of lost the trail of the silk and I was trying to figure out where the burrow was going. And all of a sudden the sand that I was digging collapsed uh, on top of my hands as I was digging and I just had searing pain in my hand and... I was like, oh, okay, you know, keep calm. This is incredibly painful. Like my eyes were sort of watering a little bit. And the first symptom of a funnel web bite is usually extreme pain. 
So I sort of sat back and I was like, all right, think calm, think logical, get the snake bite kit out of your bag because it's the same sort of first aid for a snake bite as a funnel web compression bandage and keep still. And I was just monitoring my symptoms to see if they matched a funnel web bite. And fortunately, they didn't because my hand started to just swell and it turned fire engine red and it was really hot and it my, my hand swelled up so much that I couldn't bend my fingers. And then I realized, oh, okay, I've actually just been stung by a bull ant. And as I looked around, I noticed there was actually some bull ants a, a little distance away and I'd accidentally dug into the side of their nest without realizing. <laughs> so I was relieved to only be stung <laughs> by one of the most painful ants as opposed to a <laughs> funnel web. If it had been a funnel web, what would you have done? What action do you need to take after that initial compression? Uh, let's get to a hospital and probably get anti-venom as soon as possible. Funnel web venom is is obviously really serious. Uh, even though it's incredibly complex and made of thousands of toxins, there's one particular toxin that really seems to be responsible for the envenomation. And that toxin, the delta hexatoxin, affects our nervous system. And it basically sends our nerves haywire. So they're sending too many signals and not turning off the way that they're supposed to. And that can cause vomiting, it causes severe pain, it causes sort of muscle spasms. And in really serious cases, it can actually cause respiratory paralysis. So you can't breathe properly anymore. And that's why it's really important if you do suspect a funnel web bite to go seek medical attention straight away. You're wanting to collect funnel webs partly in order to get their venom. What do you want funnel web venom for? As an Australian, I think it's personally really cool that we have these spiders unique to us, our country that is the deadliest in the world, but also potentially one of the most useful because funnel web venoms are the most complex venoms on the planet. They have potentially over 3,000 toxins in them, whereas, you know, most tarantulas are in the range of 1,000 and snakes are more in the range of like 100. So these funnel webs have incredibly complex, sophisticated venoms. And we're looking at them for several things. So one of my projects is trying to develop synthetic anti-venom as a cheaper, safer alternative to current anti-venom just against that single toxin as opposed to the other 3,000 toxins that are in the venom. But we're also really interested in harnessing funnel web venom for drug discovery and biotechnology. So there's actually already been an Australian funnel web spider toxin from the Blue Mountains funnel web that has been developed into a commercially available insecticide over in the US that's eco-friendly. A really big project that our lab has been heavily involved in along with others from the University of Queensland and the Victor Chang Institute is actually studying a Queensland funnel web spider toxin for really exciting potential for treating stroke and even heart attacks. How could it work for that? Explain to me how would something so toxic, if we were to have it, you know, have the fangs shoot it into us, how could it help with stroke or other human illnesses? We can't obviously inject you with funnel web spider venom to treat your stroke. So we actually have to study all of those different toxins within the venom and separate them out and make them synthetically in the lab away from the rest of the venom so that it's just one particular peptide or toxin that we're investigating. Incredible. So this is what you want to be able to do. You've got your funnel web that you've, that you've collected and is in your Tupperware container. How do you actually get the venom out? Oh, the short answer to collecting venom is very carefully. <laughs> the, it, the long answer is it actually depends on the spider. So for things like tarantulas, which are larger, and we generally do try to work with larger spiders because bigger spider equals bigger venom yield. So for the tarantulas, it's sort of similar to milking a snake. We pick the spider up by the essentially the back of the head and I get them to bite down on a tube with a little bit of a plastic covering so they have something to bite through. Now, the spiders don't want to give up their venom if they don't have to. It takes a lot of energy for them to produce all of those toxins that they use for catching their prey and defending themselves. So I actually have to give them a little electric shock to their fangs. It doesn't hurt the spider. It's just enough to make the powerful muscles in their fangs squeeze down so the venom comes out of the gland and into the tube. 
but I have to collect from lots of spiders to actually have enough because you only get a tiny drop per milking. And we usually give the spiders at least six weeks to recover. Now, the funnel webs are the opposite of that. So most spiders don't want to give up their venom. The funnel webs uniquely drip venom from their fangs. So they will rear up into what we call threat display. So this is where they're leaning on their back legs, they've got their front legs up in the air and they're flexing their fangs. And that's their way of saying, back off, you don't wanna, you don't wanna mess with me, I'm going to win this fight to scare away potential predators. And as part of that, they actually drip venom from their fangs. So for me to collect their venom, I will put the, the funnel web into a different container, one that doesn't have the dirt that they normally live in. And then I take some tweezers and I sort of gently tap their legs and that just makes them see red. It's like waving a flag in front of a bull and they rear up and they start striking at me. So I have to sort of do this delicate balance of teasing them a little bit so that they rear up into their threat display and then I take a pipette and suck the drops of venom off between strikes. And actually one of the things that really annoys them is me gently blowing on their face. <laughs> And oh, it just makes them super mad so that I get lots of good venom. And then once again, once they've given up their venom, I'll put them back in their container and give them, you know, six weeks of rest. And you can blow on their face from quite a distance is what I just want you to confirm with me. Define a distance, well, probably not six feet. <laughs> it's not social distancing. Do you blow through a tube or you've actually got to get close enough to blow on it directly? Uh, I just blow on them directly. <sighs> I've had quite a few years working with them now, so I'm very sort of comfortable with how they behave. But you do have to have pretty fast reflexes because sometimes they, they'll run at you quite quickly. And actually one of the ways that I've developed to make milking safer is a lot of people don't realise, but funnel webs actually can't climb plastic or glass. So as long as I put them in a tall plastic container, they can't get out. Once you've collected that venom through that little plastic tube, where do you store it or what happens to it next? So one of the really nice things about working with spider venom is that they're actually incredibly chemically and thermally stable. So that means that the, the toxins in spider venom don't break down very easily. So uh, basically, once I get the venom, I'll kind of put it all in a, a little tube and I put it through this process called freeze drying, which dries out all of the sort of water in that venom. And it leaves you with just the toxins in this like concentrated form. But it, it looks quite funny because you go from this tiny little drop of clear, potentially deadly liquid to a tube full of fluffy white powder, which seems really innocuous for, you know, holding a tube of one of the world's deadliest venoms. <laughs> so you mentioned that, that there's already use of a funnel web venom in insecticide. What kind of human application are scientists most excited about in terms of human disease? Where does it where does it look like spider venom might be most likely to be used quickly? Yeah, so there are actually already six commercially available drugs developed from venomous animals. Several of them treat hypertension, so high blood pressure coming from snake venom, and that was actually where the first venom-derived drug came from. And there are also some drugs that come from cone snails and also venomous lizards that treat chronic pain and diabetes. So a lot of the initial research for spider venoms, it really has only kind of kicked off in the last 20 years or so as the technology has improved so that we can study those tiny, tiny amounts of venom. And a lot of the early research really focused on using spider venoms to develop painkillers. And there's some really promising stuff there for treating irritable bowel syndrome. I think the work that our lab has been doing on the stroke and heart attack is really, really exciting. And it's actually coming from the funnel web. And it's, it's about to move into clinical trials for extending the life of heart transplants because what's really cool about this funnel web toxin, even though funnel webs are a, a deadly spider, this individual toxin or peptide is able to sort of protect our cells from the damage caused by a lack of oxygen. So it helps to keep the heart alive outside of the body for longer to improve heart transplants. <laughs> Incredible. Thankfully, you have never been bitten by a funnel web, but you did get a pretty nasty bite while you were in the Amazon. What happened? So I was lucky enough to be working in the Peruvian Amazon in 2019. 
and I was having a really great time sitting in a canoe on the river, observing some wildlife. And actually, I was watching piranhas splashing about, eating, scavenging something on the surface of the river. And I was totally transfixed by these piranhas. And I just felt something sort of brush my leg. And I didn't even think about it. I just kind of scratched my leg with my hand and was immediately just doubled over with some of the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life. It felt like my arm had just been plunged into boiling oil. I like the wind was knocked out of me. I couldn't even speak. I just kind of doubled over and collapsed into the canoe. And as I was like curled up, I saw this bright blue wasp twitching in the in the bottom of the boat. And I realized that I'd been stung by a tarantula hawk wasp. So this is a wasp that actually hunts tarantulas and will sting the tarantula and then paralyze the tarantula so it can snip off the legs. It chomps the legs of the tarantula off and then it drags the tarantula body back to a safe space where it will lay its eggs and then the larva of the wasp will eat the tarantula alive. Oh but God. these wasps are also famous for having the second most painful insect sting oh. in the world. <laughs> oh, what terrible luck, Samantha. How, like, what happened? How did you treat it? I think my first concern was I already carry an EpiPen for allergies to nuts and things, and I was a couple of days away from a hospital. So even though I was in excruciating pain, my main concern was actually monitoring for any symptoms of anaphylaxis. <laughs> and so I was sort of trying to force myself to eat some of my you know, antihistamines and just see how the pain was going. And then the next thing I was doing was I was just I guess my academic interest kicked in and I was looking at how bad the swelling was and trying to rate how bad the pain was and how long it was lasting and what kind of pain it was because that's different signaling pathways so that I could report back to my, my fellow venom scientists <laughs> what it felt like. And how long and, uh, until that, that terrible pain started to lessen? Oh, I think it lasted, the really bad pain was about three hours, oh. but my hand was swollen and sore for uh, at least four days. And the funny thing was in my camp, I had seen bullet ants, which are considered the most painful venomous insect sting on the planet. And I had been mentally like psyching myself up to deliberately sting myself with one of the bullet ants because I was actually studying different Amazonian ant venoms. And I thought I couldn't really call myself a, a venom scientist without, you know, feeling what it feels like. And, and these ants are well known because they were used in traditional cultural rituals. So boys would have to sting their hand, uh, put their hand into a glove made of stinging ants and then, you know, endure the stings to prove that they were a man. And I thought, well, I have to prove that I'm a venom scientist <laughs> by enduring this sting. But it just so happened that as I was planning to sting myself that night, I copped the um, tarantula hawk wasp in the morning and I thought, oh, that'll do me. Second, <laughs> second is good enough in this case. Absolutely. I was an incredible career that you embarked on. Do you think back to that little girl terrified of spiders hiding behind a mum in the botanic garden? Gardens and, and are you surprised by where you find yourself now? If you had told me that I'd become a spider venom scientist, I would never have in my wildest dreams believed you because I was so, so scared of spiders and really didn't think that I would study science at all. So it's, it's quite funny, like no one in my family really like believed that I was actually going to go and study spiders. And I think when I told them that I was going to go work in a spider venom lab and they laughed because they knew how scared of spiders I was, that was almost like a little bit of a, a motivator of, I'll show you, don't tell me what I can and cannot do. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're at the point where you're hanging up little Christmas stockings and little Christmas decorations for them. So, you know, what a transformation. Absolutely. I haven't quite progressed to hanging up Christmas decorations for the parasites yet, but uh, that could be on the cards. Samantha, it's really fascinating to, to meet you and hear about your work. Thank you so much for being my guest on Conversations. Thank you. It was a pleasure.